Good afternoon. My name is Tyrone Banks. I'm the strategist for the Asian American and Pacific Islanders of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the annual Quan T. Shung Memorial Lecture. Today, the National Institute of Health will acknowledge and honor Dr. Zhang's dual contributions to science and to the Asian American Pacific Islander community. I just want to acknowledge special um, co-sponsors that did this event today. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and the NIH Office of Intramural Research. Also, special thanks to the Washington, D.C., Baltimore chapter of the Society of Chinese Bioscientists in America for their support of the reception which will follow the lecture. Dr. Chong served past president of this organization. And also, I want to congratulate 30 years of anniversary for that organization. Also, I would like to acknowledge today, we have present Dr. Chong's wife, Diane, and his daughter, Diana. Dr. Zhang was an accomplished Chinese-American virologist and chief of the Molecular Virology Section, National Allergy of Infectious Diseases, Laboratory of Molecular Biology. He was a champion for increasing diversity at the NIH, especially for the representation of Asian-American Pacific Islanders within the senior leadership positions at the National Institute of Health. Dr. Chong was an active member of the Asian Pacific Islander Employee Committee, which provides recommendations to the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion on Asian American employees issues. Dr. Chong led in establishing the May Lectures to commemorate Asian American Pacific Islanders Heritage Month in the mid 2000. Before then, the month was only celebrated with social and cultural events. Because of his vision, today we celebrate the outstanding scientific and leadership achievements of Asian American Pacific Islander scientists and administrators. Again, I welcome you as we acknowledge our fellow co-workers Quan T. Shong and pay tribute to, to his life, one whose leadership and insight was deeply enhanced, employees, careers, and made the National Institute of Health a better organization. Above all of these acknowledgments of Dr. Chong, the most important is that he served as a role model of how we serve others. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm uh, Roland Owens, Assistant Director of the NIH Office of Intramural Research. Um, KT Zhang, who we are honoring here today, had three great passions, and I'm glad to see that all three of those are represented here today. They are his family, virology, and diversity of the NIH senior leadership. Uh, I've interacted with uh, KT off and on for about the last 20 years. And uh, first as a scientist, as part of the virology interest group, and then uh, later on the diversity front. 
we'd very frequently have interactions and exchanges, sometimes online, sometimes in the parking lot between building uh, one and building four. And, you know, we would have you know, vigorous debates about why there's this underrepresentation of Asian Pacific Islanders at the uh, scientific director level and lab and branch chief level, in spite of the fact that we have very good representation among the senior, uh, tenured senior investigators. And although we would differ about the causes about, uh, of, of why that, um, that was true, one thing we agreed on was that one way to solve the problem was to increase the profiles of Asian and Pacific Islander scientists who were in senior leadership positions. <clears throat> if uh, KT had not died tragically, he would probably be standing here today being the MC of this event, you know, that, which would be named after some other famous um, Asian uh, scientist. But, oh, yes, I would also like to thank um, Ms. Sinead Jackson in our office uh, who developed this wonderful flyer that we used uh, for this presentation. And it has a, a great picture of, of KT over, you know, over everything. And it reminds me, when I look at it, that he's looking over all of our shoulders, reminding us to keep moving forward on all fronts, family, virology, and diversity. And I'll now turn over uh, the microphone uh, to Dr. Wan Jun Chen from NIDCR, who will introduce today's keynote speaker. So good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Um, for uh, coming for this very important uh, lecture. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank the um, Katie's family and also the leadership of the interim program, Dr. Gottesman, Owens, and Dr. Banks, too. Um, I'm um, the senior investigator from NRDCR. I also serve with the president for this year's SCBA, uh, DC and the Baltimore chapter. Um, DC, actually, Dr. K.T. John was or, um, not only the president for the local chapter, also he served the uh, president for the uh, uh, SCB in America, uh, which, which uh, we have currently more than 3,000 uh, 3, members. So now today, <clears throat> it is my uh, great pleasure and uh, extreme honor to introduce uh, this year's speaker for uh, K.T. John's memorial lecture, Dr. Jack Liang, MD. Dr. Liang is the chief for liver uh, diseases branch and deputy director for translational uh, research at NIDDK NIH. Dr. Liang is uh, internationally recognized and a renowned and dominant thought leader in the field of viral hepatitis and also liver diseases. He was um, one of the best, he has made groundbreaking discoveries critical, uh, critical to understanding hepatitis C virus uh, in terms of the pathogenesis and the treatment, and this helped develop a novel uh, therapy for the H uh, HCV vac vaccination. He collaboratively established the first infectious uh, HCV culture system, allowing um, this dissection of the viral element necessary for uh, infectiousity and pr propagation. And um, this greatly fascinated the development of no HCV specific therapies. His seminal work on um, interferon based HCV treatment provided the mechanistic foundation for the subsequent molecular targeted therapy. Using genomic technology, Dr. Liang identified novel host pathways we told to link HCV infection, inflammation, and the metabolic dysfunction. His extensive work on HCV-like particles provides the innovative and viable approach to HCV vaccine development. Dr. Liang has also performed pioneer work on HBV, not only HCV, 
and in terms of pathogenesis and the therapy. He has published more than 200 papers in the quite uh, different, uh, very prodigious journals, and edited numerous books. Dr. Liang was a uh, associate editor for uh, gastroenterology in 1996 through 2001, hepatology from um, 2001 through 2006, and the gut from 2004 till now, still serving. He was elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation in 1996, and to the Association of American Physicians in 2002. He was the member of the AC. Uh, CI Council from 2004 through 2007. He was on the governing board of the American Association for the Study of the Liver Diseases uh, from 2007 to 2012, and uh, served president in 2011. His understanding contributions had been recognized with numerous uh, award honors, a name of you here, including the recipient for British, a British Liver Scholar Award, the Long uh, Sheaf Lectureship, the Edward Morrow Lectureship, Bruce White Distinguished Lecture Award, the NIDDK Director Award. As a person, Dr. Liang is a very friendly, helpful friend. He also a senior member of the all SEB local chapter. Uh, in my mind, is that he always helps whenever he can, whenever he can, not only for us, for the young people in particular. Without further ado, it's my great honor. I uh, welcome Dr. Zhang. Thank you for that kind introduction. Wen Zhang, it's really a great pleasure to speak on behalf of the KT Zhang. I would also like to add my thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Mike Gottesman's office, NIAID, uh, NIH office of uh, EDI, uh, as well as uh, uh, SCBA local chapter. Um, I think we have heard a lot of very nice tributes to uh, uh, KT about his being such a scientific, uh, scientific leadership as well as uh, intellectual giant. Uh, I helped um, organize this uh, particular um, in, uh, memorial symposium uh, the year that KT uh, uh, unfortunately passing, and uh, I just want to bring your attention to the design of this particular, uh, of this particular flyer, which uh, Wei Yang did it, and uh, you can see that the bamboos in the backgrounds, and I think you may not know the story behind this design, and I think Wei Yang was very insightful in coming out with this particular design. Not only that this, the bamboo symbolize the tranquility, resilience, strength uh, of of KT, but also it provided an interesting look into this whole concept that uh, that Nolan uh, that Roland mentioned about uh, the Asian American sort of so-called the bamboo ceiling. Whether you believe it or not, but I think this is very important to raise awareness about that the Asian American, despite being the model working workers and actually not only in science but also in all profession, but really made to the top leadership level, and uh, obviously this is a this is a sort of subtle issue, but I think the fact that KT has been very instrumental in raise awareness about this particular notion, so certainly had gone a long way in terms of promoting the interests of the Asian Americans, not only in science, but also in all professions. And I'm trying to think something else I can say about KT, uh, rather than everything, all you heard about his uh, scientific prowess and being a political activist. And uh, I wasn't quite sure what to say, but then, and then the other day when I was having Chinese dinner and I came out with this, uh, this uh, fortune cookie, it says, an empty stomach is not a po uh, good political advisor. Then I thought about it and then I went through a lot of pictures that, that KT had. You can see that he's always had, having dinner or eating with, with his friends and colleagues and et cetera. So I think that dawned on me. I think one of the common greeting in, in, in Chinese, it's not, it's although ni hao ma, as you all know, is a very common greeting, but one particular greeting says ni chi bao le ma, which really means are you full? It's always a greeting that you kind of say to your good friends because it's very important in Chinese that you really feed your, uh, your guests, make sure they are full so they can be good advisor or good friends and good colleagues. And again, I think KT symbolized that. 
I always enjoy the nice meals and lunch, dinner, or whatever to socialize. And I think he think that's very important. I think this is probably why SCBA always like to sponsor receptions and dinner, etc. So I think that's again one of his legacy. And also, I want to raise the whole point about although KT did a lot of his work in HIV, but he certainly had done some very nice work in HCV. And this is the two paper that he published uh, in the in the in the 2000 and 2010 that uh, certainly has a broad insight into the area of hepatitis C. So this is really what I'm going to share with you today about the, the, the hepatitis C virus. Suffice to say that the therapy of hepatitis C has witnessed a tremendous sea change over the last five years. Initially with interferon-based therapy, approximately 10% response rate, now we have a combination of a direct acting antiviral that can achieve up to 90% of sustained virological response, which equates to cure. Unfortunately, we are somehow the victim of our success. And I certainly have heard some of the senior people make the comment that, well, hepatitis is cure, so we can move on, we shouldn't be working on it. I think that's rather short-sighted. Because first of all, why do we study biology? Second of all, I think hepatitis C virus infection is a really a great biological probe in terms of understanding life sciences. And, and then in the next 45 minutes or so, I hope I will make my case that if you do your homework, ask the right questions, come up with a uh, sound hypothesis, apply the right technologies, are willing to explore unexpected outcomes and, 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 and take the next step. There's actually a lot you can do in the field that, that maybe we have a very good therapy, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Hepatitis C virus infect hepatocytes through a highly coordinated and sequential process. First of all, interact with cell surface factors through the entry process, which I'll come back to later and then it uncodes and to release a viral genomes and that tra tra traverse to the endoplasmic reticulum where a translation of the polyprotein from the viral genome occurs. And these viral protein then complex with ER-derived structure, these membrane structure where the replication occurs. HCV is rather unique in the sense that it actually assemble in this unique subcellular structure of hepatocyte called the lipid droplets which I'll come back to later. And then the viral assemble, either they can pass directly to the next cells or complex with a lipoprotein and secreting the circulation. I think it's very rather interesting that hepatitis C virus actually circulate in complex lipoprotein function as solo Trojan horse. So therefore makes it immune to attack by neutralizing antibodies. So this is one way how hepatitis C evolved. And what's not shown in this particular diagrams are the intrinsic innate immune response. How does the cells respond to the infected cells? Also, how does the adaptive immunity recognize these HCV infected cells and try to eliminate them? Also, what's not shown are maybe there are hundreds, if not thousands, of host factors that HCV interact with in order to, in order to survive, to replicate. So these are the host factors that HC, uh, require for HCV replication and that HCV hijacks for its advantage. So, in order, so there are several ways that you can study a, such a complex biological phenomenon. I think one of the approach we have taken is that if we introduce random perturbations into HCV infected cells to force the virus to behave differently in order to understand its complexity, reveal its secrets, and identify its vulnerability, maybe we can do much better in terms of control this viral infection. So there are several different classes of turbogens. What comes to your mind, obviously, the sRNA and the microRNAs. Aptomer, these are, these are uh, molecules that create from single, such as, uh, uh, such as carbohydrates or peptide that can interact with large macromolecules, maybe causing perturbation in a cellular environment. Metabolites. All cells respond to various different metabolites. Many of the metabolites actually are receptor or ligands to many of the signaling pathways. Chemical probes, obviously small molecules, have been used to, uh, to perturb a particular biological phenomenon. 
And finally, these genetic polymorphisms, which I call the experiment of nature, in which all of us have these thousands and thousands of, of, of a single nucleotide variation in each of us that determine whether we have disease or not, et cetera, and so on. And by studying this, as you all know, that we can really gain a lot of insight about any complex biological phenomenon. I think in particular in HCV, this discovery of interferon lambda IL-28 polymorphism is an example of that. In HIV infection, the delta CCR5 is another example of how these genetic polymorphism really enables us to understand about a complex biological phenomenon. So what I'm going to share with you two stories today. One is uh, use of a small RNA, srRNA as perturbagen. And this project was uh, initiated by Frank Lee in the lab many years ago. And in collaboration with uh, the Harvard Medical School, the ICCB uh, institutions, that he was able to create a genome-wide srRNA screening technology. Not to take you to the detail, but what he had done is he set up the format of the screen so he can examine the, every step of the HCV life cycles. And in addition, he can do this high throughput screen by basically using automated sequence, I mean automated staining technology looking for viral protein infections to quantify the uh, uh, viral infections. In this, in this type of a platform, Frank could detect both host proviral factor, which facilitates HCV infection, and host antiviral factor, which inhibit HCV infection. And these are just the, the, the staining image to, to illustrate the point. On the top is staining for viral protein, core protein. And you can see that uh, these are the staining for the uh, control cells. And this is one of the positive controls. CD81 is an important cellular entry factor for HCV. You can see that once you silence it, you have a significant decrease in viral uh, uh, infection. And the bottom is staining for DNA, basically, of the nuclei, basically, uses a gauge of toxicity of the srRNA. So we can make sure that the effect we see are not due to toxicity by the srRNA transfection. And these are the two such factors proviral factor and antiviral factor. And actually, you can quantify this, use automated image analysis to give you exact percentage of the cells that's infected. And by using this, Frank was able to identify about 200 and 300 host factors that interact with HCV. Our collaborator at Harvard, Ronnie Xavier, put together this uh, fancy HCV interaction network diagram. I'm not going to take you through it, because every time I looked at it, it makes me dizzy. But I just want to point out to you, there's one particular <coughs> note of this interaction, the CHUK, inhibitor of N kappa B kinase alpha. So what is CHUK? CHUK is also called IKK alpha. It's a sub, it's a component of the IKK complex of the NF kappa B pathway. As many of you know that IKK kinase is a mass switch of the NF kappa B pathways. External uh, uh, inflammatory stimuli will basically induce this IKK activity, and then this kinase will basically phosphorylate the um, I kappa B, which basically complex and sequester the active transcriptional complex of NF kappa B in the cytoplasm. And this phosphorylation will lead to the degradation of this inhibitor, therefore release the NF kappa B transcriptional factor into the nucleus, which will recognize cognitive sequence for the NF kappa B responsive gene and activate a set of the transcription. And this particular activation can be, uh, can be uh, shut down by phosphorylating these uh, transcription factor leading to degradation. And viral infections via either toll-like receptors or rig-like helicase in the case of RNA virus and other DNA sensing, uh, uh, viral sensing molecules such as C gas and C uh, for DNA viruses can also activate this NF kappa B pathway by phosphorylating the IKK complex. Together with interferon responsive factor 3, 7, 9, and a few others, this constitutes so called the innate antiviral response leading to the induction of interferons. The IKK beta and gamma, that's the so-called the canonical NF kappa B activation, they are absolutely required for these pathways. Whereas IKK alpha, which is one of the components, is, is thought to be involved, it can activate NF kappa B, but it's not required, so it's being labeled as non-canonical pathway by Michael Karen's group in, uh, in, in San Diego. So in order to pursue this study, uh, to this, uh, this conundrum further, 
what Frank did is he further demonstrated that indeed IKK alpha is required for HCV propagation. In this particular uh, essay, he looked at the HCV RNA level as opposed to some kind of reporter system. He can indeed, real, uh, indeed see a significant reduction of HCV RNA, both intracellular and HCV and extracellular RNA in cells transfected with a pool of SI RNA against IKK alpha. These two just are positive controls. We know they are proviral factors. Furthermore, Frank was able to see that this particular uh, uh, inhibition is correlated very well to the efficiency of the silencing of the IKK alpha, which demonstrates that this is not an off target effect. And because SRNA often can induce off target effects, so it's important to see that the silencing, the magnitude and silencing of the particular gene correlate well with the phenotype that you hope to see. Furthermore, Frank transfected wild type IKK alpha into the cells, you're able to see a significant increase of the HCV RNA levels, as well as production of an infectious virus. In contrast, when he transfected IKK alpha, a negative dominant mutant of IKK alpha, which is, deficiency, which is deficient in the kinase activity, he can actually suppress the, the uh, HCV RNA replication in terms of the RNA level and the production of infectious virus. So to further explore this apparent uh, conundrum between the IKK alpha and the rest of the IKK, Frank decided to look specifically at each, sub each component of NR kappa B, and, and by silencing it, he wanted to know what the phenotype on HCV uh, replication is. As you can see that when he silenced all these other components of NR kappa B, he saw an increase in HCV replication, as you would imagine, because NR kappa B plays an antiviral role, right? But in contrast, he saw a significant decrease in, in HCV replication when he silenced IKK alpha. So clearly, these two have opposing effect, even though we all thought it, it's, it's in the same pathway. So in order to understand where does IKK alpha, Frank's utilized various different virologic assay. We have quite a few HCV virologic assay in our hand that we can look specifically at the entry of the virus. Uh, single cycle infection assay looking at all the steps up to assembly, looking at the, the translation of the polyprotein using the HCV iris assay, and then HCV subgenomic replicon assay, which looks specifically at the replication of the viral RNA. And then finally, we have HCV CC assay that can look at the entire viral life cycle of, uh, of the HCV infection. So by using these assays, Frank was able to demonstrate that IKK alpha acts on the step of the assembly of the virus. As I mentioned to you, the assembly of virus occur at the lipid droplets. So what is the relevance of this? <coughs> so this just show you that in HCV infected cells, the green stand for lipid droplet, the red stand for HCV core protein. And you can see that there is very close association of the lipid droplets with HCV core protein, which we know because that's where the assembly occurs. But in cells, the silence of IKK alpha, you can see that there was significant reduction in the lipid droplets, although we still see core protein in some of the cells, but they don't co-localize anymore, which indicate that when we silence IKK alpha, somehow the assembly process is disrupted. Furthermore, Frank was able to show that by overexpressing wild type I, uh, uh, IKK alpha, which is tagged with the HA, as shown here, this is antibody against uh, the HA, this is the lipid droplet, you can saw the cells that overexpressing this wild type of IKK alpha, there was significant increase in the lipid droplet contents. In contrast, when you overexpress the negative dominant mutants, I sh uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, again, staying with HA, in these cells express this negative dominant mutant, there was significant reduction in the lipid droplet formation. So the following question is, so how does HCV induce lipid droplets? And to make the long story short, <clears throat> Frank was able to identify this stretch of RNA sequence at the three prime of HCV genome that is responsible for the induction of the lipid droplet biogenesis. This also a sequence that contain 
what we call the pathogen-associated molecular pattern for HCV. And that's the one that actually interact directly with the rig I helicase family and induce interferon response by Michael Gales group. So this is just show you that on the top that these are just control and uh, you can see that the, the staining for IKK alpha and lipid droplets and when he silenced uh, IKK alpha there was a decrease in the baseline lipid droplet <coughs> content and when he transfect these cells with this three prime UTR sequence, the untranslated sequence, he saw a significant increase in the lipid droplet formations that can be silenced or abrogated by silencing with SRNA against IKK alpha. And using a different technique of visualizing these lipid droplets using the botipid uh, coupled dye, uh, he also saw a similar increase of the lipid droplet content in HCV PAM, transfected cell, as well as a synthetic viral mimetic called poly IC, which can do the same thing, being recognized rig I, to induce the particular um, um, lipid droplet inductions. So, this will implicate that the IKK alpha must somehow activate some kind of a transcriptional program by going to the nucleus. There's some evidence in the literature that IKK alpha actually upon activation does go into the nucleus as opposed to the other IKK alpha component. And this is really just show one particular example. In the HCD infected cells stain with either IKK alpha in red, HCD core protein in green, and the nucleus is in blue. You can see that in the HCD infected cells there was an increase in the red color in the nucleus just by visualizing it, right? And actually, you can actually measure the by drawing a line from the uninfected cell to infected cells and looking into the nucleus of this uninfected nucleus and the infected cell. There was significant increase in the intensity of the red in the infected cells, and this would be quantified by. Uh, by looking at many different cells, indeed, there was a, a, a nuclear localization of IKK alpha and HCV infected cells. So what is the consequence of the IKK alpha nu uh, nuclear localizations? And to answer this question, uh, Frank did the microarray gene expression analysis, just looking at what genes are upregulated in HCV infected cells as, as a consequence of this IKK alpha nuclear localization. So he set up four condition, control cells, cells transfected with IKK alpha, and cells that infected with HCV either transfected with control sRNA or IKK alpha um, uh, sRNA. So by analyzing this data, what he saw is that first in HCV infected cells, he saw a significant upregulation of whole rate of lipid, of a lipid metabolism gene is shown here. Furthermore, the transfection of, or silencing of IKK alpha was able to abrogate the, the induction of this lipid droplet gene by HCV RNA. And even in cells not infected with HCV, as, as IKK alpha silence was able to reduce lipid droplet genes expressions. And as many of you know that SIEPP1 and 2 are the master switch of the lipid metabolism genes. And this is really just showing you these two genes are also upregulated by HCV infections and that can be abrogated by silencing with sRNA against IKK alpha. And Frank also done an additional experiment to show that indeed the IKK alpha upregulation activated the SIEBP in order to induce all these lipogenic genes. So the SIEBP actually is the upstream of the leopard genes that are acting on by the IKK alpha uh, signaling pathway. So this is how we put together. So in HCV infection, the viral uh, the viral um, genome recognized by the Rigli helicase series of signal trans trans transduction events leading to induction of interferons and antiviral genes that in turn are blocking viral infections. And in that, the particular cell line we use is defective actually for the Rigli helicase. That's why we're able to see a parallel proviral effect of this particular uh, event mediated through IKK alpha, which in turn induce SIEBP that will activate a, a whole lipogenic uh, a gene signature, induce uh, up, uh, uh, upregulate lipid droplet biogenesis, which will facilitate viral assembly. 
Although we really don't know what's sort of between the viral RNA and the RKK alpha, but we thought this is a really a rather interesting story. So we wrote it up and sent it to the journal. And this is a kind of a tyranny of the journal review that we came back with the comments that, well, I think you should be more explicit about this. You can't just say it's a miracle. You've got to really demonstrate it. We kind of say, well, gee, we have to go back to the drawing board. But fortunately, we were able to go back to our bioinformatics and really look at all the genes that have been involved in HCV infection, try to see where they can gain a clue in terms of which one may be responsible. And one of the genes is a DDX3X, it's a dead box polypeptide X link. And this is actually a gene that has been, in, has been shown by many different laboratories to play a proviral role in HCV replications. Okay? So that's been shown by many different groups. And what's also interesting about this, 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 this gene is that it's belonged to a family of, of uh, RNA binding helicase, of which Rig I helicase is a member of it. So the hypothesis is that this maybe is also a viral sensor. Maybe that's why it's picking up the, the HCV RNA in order to activate the IKK alpha pathway. And without really showing all the data, uh, Frank was able to indeed demonstrate that. And this is just one particular confocal image that showed the localization of IKK alpha in DDX3 in HCV infected cells. So in the bottom, this is a staining for DDX3 and IKK alpha. You can see that there's really no localization at all. But in HCV infected cells, you can see these formation of these granules that, of which both DDX3X and IKK alpha co-localize. And furthermore, using biochemical techniques such as co-immunoprecipitation, Frank was able to show that, that indeed the DDX3X and IKK alpha co-localize by co-immunoprecipitation in an HCV dependent manner. Again, this is another evidence that suggests that this is DDX3 maybe indeed is an upstream signal that activate uh, IKK alpha. So this is how we put together that that's where it is. And um, subsequently, Veronique Penn in the lab was able to actually demonstrate that DDX3X, which actually is a, has been shown to be a component of stress granule, actually recruiting the stress granules. And that's why we saw this granule. These are stress granules. These are only containing molecules that, that related to viral infections and, and over translations and where the RNA get degraded. And actually, that's the that's organelles that DDX3 was able to recruit or interact with HCV RNA and recruit IKK alpha and activate that pathway. And what's also interesting is that both DDX3, I mean, of course, IKK alpha is linked to IKK uh, uh, pathway as in turn antiviral, but it's also some crosstalk between the DDX3 and the upstream signaling pathway. A uh, study from Andrew Bowie's labs was able to show that DDX3 actually play a role in terms of the upregulation of this uh, rig I helicase signaling pathway. So there's clearly a lot of overtalk between these uh, pathways, whether it's antiviral or proviral. So HCV exploits host's innate response and hijacks host lipid metabolism to its advantage. And also, identification of novel host pathways in HCV life cycle has implication in HCV therapeutics. As many of you know that nl kappa b is a very important pathway that a lot of industrial pharmaceutical effort in trying to develop an inhibitor of the IKK. And there are, we are able to get our hands on these inhibitors. And two of them here are general inhibitors of all the IKK uh, components, whereas this particular compound is only active against IKK beta. So Frank was able to show that either in our cell line, HU7 cell line, or primary human hepatocytes, there's a dose-dependent reduction of HCV RNA by both of these general inhibitors, but not by these IKK beta-specific uh, inhibitor. So by inference, it's probably the other component, not, not the IKK beta. Unfortunately, uh, nobody has IKK alpha specific inhibitor, but the implication would be if there were an IKK alpha specific inhibitor, this could be used to uh, uh, inhibit HCV um, infections. So subsequent to this, Frank was able to map all these all these factors he identified in his SRNA screen by using all the different assay I mentioned to you, assign them functional, assign them either to entry, translation, replication, assembly, etc. And this is just a complicated map, and that uh, he's able to allocate the source and just briefly mention that the circle represents the proviral factor, 
in the in the square represent the antiviral factor. You can see that predominantly these are antiviral factor, uh, proviral factor. So in the the Chuck and DDX3 is really constitute a small component of these interaction maps. So furthermore, obviously a lot of these factor are attractive target for the study. So Cameron Schweitzer in the lab was really home in on this particular gene, this antiviral gene, the NDRG1, which uh, stands for NMIG downstream regulated gene one. And it is, he showed that it is a novel antiviral factor that restricts viral assembly. Oh, what's interesting about the NDRG1 is that it's also downregulated by HCV RNA, which kind of would make sense. That's what the virus is trying to do, right? Trying to downregulate the antiviral gene. But also, this gene has been thought to be a tumor suppressor gene. So by inactivating it, perhaps that's why there's association between HCV infection and liver cancer. And Fan Zhang in the lab focused on this SMAT 6-7 factors. As you all know that SMATs are uh, signaling molecule of TGF beta, where 6-7 are the inhibitory SMAT. But what Fang showed is that this SMAT 6-7 actually can trans transcriptionally regulate the expression of heparin sulfate proteoglycans, which are part of the HCV entry pathways. And Frank subsequently also was able to focus on one other potential novel entry factor. This is an E coherent, which is part of the heron junctions. And it is a novel entry factor that can regulate the localization of two well known entry factors for HCV, Claudin 1 and Occludin. So these are the three examples that this, this set of a map provide a, a, a rich source of uh, study in trying to identify not only the virology, but also, also biology related to many of these uh, host factors. I just want to get back to the correlation of HCV and hepatic steatosis. One of the pathological hallmark of HCV infections in liver biopsy is hepatic steatosis, which is very similar to the histological profile of another common liver disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, which is associated with insulin resistance, metabolic syndromes, and uh, probably caused by lipotoxicity. So what is the common thread in these two disease? I think this came from actually a, a sort of somewhat interesting uh, uh, field of the GWAS study, because there's been a lot of interest trying to identify genetic polymorphisms associated with, with NASH or NAFO disease. And ALT has been used as a surrogate marker for NASH in some of these big population-based GWAS studies. So two such studies using the ALT as marker and done a GWAS study was able to identify several particular polymorphisms or loci that are associated with NAFO or NASH. One of them is on chromosome 22nd, the PNPL3 locus, which has also been uh, shown by Helen Hobbs Group from Texas using, using exon sequencing of, and uh, as well this uh, uh, marker of uh, liver fat on, ultra, on radiographic evidence of that. That's also corroborated. So it's certainly a very validated gene associated with NAFO. But there's another locus that came up. It's in the chromosome 10, which that's where the Chuck or IKK alpha resides. So it's sort of interesting that some polymorphism that in this gene that we know induce lipid biogenesis may be implicated in NAFO. So my second story is going to tell you about using the chemical probes for turbogen. This was initiated by Zhang Yi Hu. Uh, this is really through a funding by initial funding by the NIH Roadmap Molecular Library Program back many years ago. And uh, so this is obviously an implication that perhaps this is how we can identify novel therapeutic agents against HCV. So I mentioned to you that the therapy of hepatitis C has advanced sub substantially over the five years, and most of them have been focusing on those called direct acting antivirals. These are the drugs directly acting on certain viral protein or enzyme that we know that are important for viral replication. Three of them, NS3, that's the protease, NS5A is a replicase cofactor, and NS5B, which is a, a, a polymerase, and these are the, uh, the drugs that are really being approved that seem to be very effective. The NS3 is telafivir, seprovir, NS5A is a, a daclotasivir, and NS5B is the, uh, inf the famous or the infamous sofosivir, of course, $1,000 a pill. 
And uh, so these are really the three major classes that pharmaceutical companies are focusing on. This is really classical drug development, right? They identify the targets, that's where they go after in terms of the inhibitors. But we thought to, took a, took a, to take alternative strategy for therapeutic development HCV using instead of the reverse chemical genetics, that's what most pharmaceutical companies have been using, we use the former chemical genetics, basically a phenotypic screen. So what we do is that we will screen uh, will perform an unbiased probing of the entire viral life cycle and develop a cell-based assay that's more biological relevant. And this can be adapted to a high throughput for, uh, screening format. And then we can screen a large, diverse, small molecule library in the cell-based screen. And perhaps we can identify novel antiviral targets and compounds. And, but obviously the caveat with the approach is that we have to identify the target because we don't know what it is because this is a phenotypic screen but we can come back and look for them. So, um, so in order to obviously do this, we have to develop a suitable uh, high throughput cell-based assay. And Zhang Yi, who actually spent over a year trying to develop the assay using a different, very different format. So what do you find out? One of these particular format is very sensitive and specific and can be used for high throughput screen. This is the taking advantage of the cre lock system. So basically, you generate a reporter that contain the secreted luciferase but it's silent because it's flanked by the LOX P sites. And this is introduced into the cell lines, so therefore the cell line expresses reported gene, but it's silent in terms of the, report, uh, uh, the reporter activity. So when he infects these cells with recombinant HCV containing the creep recombinase, which is when it was specifically cleaved out the LOX P flanking site, allowed the production of the, of the uh, secreted luciferase, and this would be the readout of this assay. So, he was able to demonstrate there was a very, there was very nice dose response curve with, to some of the known HCV drugs such as ribovirin, 2 prime methylcytidine, and cyclosporin A. So he was able to miniaturize to 1536 well format that's that's important for um, high throughput screen, and then perform uh, uh, had to perform quite well in terms of assays, and then he did a quantitative uh, qPCR screen together with our NCATS colleagues, and this is a commercial library of 100, uh, about 12, 1,280 compounds. And from the primary screen, he identified 16 compounds that have reasonable activity. And with the secondary screen, he identified seven, comp seven of those compounds had toxicity. Therefore, that's probably the reason. And then four were not confirmed. So five of them were confirmed. So what are the five? So five of them, one is the cyclosporin A which we know is an anti-HCV uh, drug. And the second one is uh, diacylglycerol kinase inhibitor 1. Diacylglycerol uh, uh, diacyl kinase is an important kinase for the lipid tropical formation, so that would make sense, right? And then the third uh, factor is uh, P30A MAP in, uh, kinase inhibitor. Again, study in the past have shown that the MAP kinase signaling pathway is important for productive HCV infections. And, the f and, the, and then the, f uh, the, f the f the fourth compound is uh, prochlorperazine, which is an actin inhibitor. Again, that makes sense because actin is required for effective entry of the virus into the cells. So with this, with this encouraging results, uh, Zhang Yi performed this high throughput screen with our colleagues from NCAS, and they look at all the library they have, the MLSMR library, the NPC, and the Citrophon library. They are probably total about 400,000 com 400, compounds. And then from the first screen, they identify about 3,000 of these compounds. So with various different data analysis, bioinformatics, and they were able to narrow down to 655 compounds. And this further undergoes secondary assay, basically just repeated HCV reporter assay, but with a higher, uh, higher, uh, with a more concentration in terms of the dose response. In the same token, they did a cell toxicity assay just to rule out all the uh, toxic compounds. And indeed, they were able to narrow down to about 215 compounds, which further subject to a, what we call orthogonal assay, basically use a different reporter system. In this case, we actually stain for a core for viral protein. This is the same assay system we use for the sRNA screen. So this is just a totally different assay that will indeed validate the results from the reporter assay shown before. So 157 compounds result from these secondary screen. So then. Zhang Yi and other fellows in the lab did a lot of these uh, very different biologic assays, was able to specifically identify each many of these compounds in the stage of viral infection that these compounds are targeted to. 
and then using structural chemical informatics and looking at the potency, toxicity, look at whether the drug is druggable or the compound is druggable and the various different things. They focused on the 16 compounds and of the 16, we selected three, three of them for probe development. Two of them focus on entry, one of them on assembly. We intentionally avoid the, um, the replication because we don't really want to reinvent the wheel of coming up with some, some replication inhibitor which is really being well developed. And then now we're in the lead optimization, uh, optimization step. So the whole process actually didn't take really that long. Once we get going, we started the high throughput screen in 2011. We finished it up until the tertiary assay 2013. And up to now, we're able to optimize some of the leads I just mentioned to you about. So actually, this has really gone rather quickly, actually, thanks to the, to the NCAS with all their capability and technology, was able to push this uh, through in a, in a almost like a, a pharmaceutical company manner. So I just want to go back to on this particular library that we, we focus on, this NPC library. This NPC library is a known pharmaceutical collection library. It's developed by NCATS, and it's a comprehensive collection of approved and investigation drugs, including um, 2,400 small molecule libraries, entities, and what we show is that 39 active compounds after primary secondary screens from this NPC library of the 3911 are antihistamines. And so therefore, we went back. As you know, the antihistamine did a lot of different first generation, second generation, third tertiary, uh, or third generation antihistamines used to treat symptoms of allergy. So we got a collection of all the antihistamine and to test them. And also, it will give us an idea about the structure activity relationship. Because many of these compounds are either in so-called piperzine or piperdine or or, or phenothiazine, it's all simple heptadine classes. So these are different classes. So that can give us an idea whether the activity versus structure. And what we find is that there's no correlation of these compounds with the antihistamine activity, which is which is really showing knowing that the, the, the fact we see on HCV is not because of the antihistamine activities. And the five of them have very potent activity with EC50 or less than one micromolar, very active and, and low toxicity as well. So one of them is chlorcycazine. And this is just to show you a dose response of the uh, chlorcycazine in the, in the HCV reporter system. You can see that this is a, this is an inhibitory uh, curve and this is a toxicity curve. So you can see there's a huge therapeutic window there. And chlorcycazine actually exists in nature as a racemic mixture because there's a chiral center right in the middle of this molecule. So this is gives you about 44 nanomolar in terms of the EC50 for, for this particular racemic mixture. So Jim Bo Chow in, uh, in NCAT decided to purify the, uh, the enantiomer of the racemic mixture looking at R versus S configuration. And he was able to, we were able to show that the equally effective either the R or S configurations in terms of the activity against HCV. Again, none of them are toxic. It is known that these uh, chlorcycazine is metabolized. Oh, I'm sorry. This is also shown using the HCV on a level assay instead of the reporter. There was significant reduction of a viral level treating with either the simic mixture or the individual enantiomers. And this is just cyclosporin A as a control. So it's known that these um, uh, chlorcycazine is metabolized by demethylase and host into the north chlorcycazine, basically loss a methyl group here. And this compound is also active as well as, as, well as uh, against HCV. However, it does have some more toxicity in the cell toxicity assay. Um, and then when Melissa look at the, look at the antihistamine activity of this compound in D, the racemic mixture was active in terms of antihistamine, but the R was the, the more active component of the uh, enantiomer mixture in terms of the enantiomers. And whereas norcloxycosine have no activity at all, which is known already in the past in terms of the antihistamine activity. So to further demonstrate further that we say, well, we should go into the in vivo model. So there is a, a small animal mouse model. It's an albumin UPA skip mouse model. This is the one that actually we can graft human hepatocyte into the liver of these mice and then actually infect these uh, mice with uh, HCV. And that can allow us to test against, uh, against whatever compounds of the interest. I just want one point of, of caution that this particular compound was approved in the uh, 1940 to 50 for antihistamine. So there's very, very little data out there in terms of what is the pharmacokinetics and, and its metabolism, et cetera. So we actually have to 
do some pharmacokinetics and show that uh, this compound actually has, has decent pharmacological property, actually concentrate in the liver as well, which is, uh, which is good to know. So anyway, so we decided to do this uh, uh, efficacy test, and, we, and this is done in collaboration with our Japanese colleagues. And this system that uh, the, in, HCV, in, the, in the HCV infected mice, either by genotype 1 or 2, and uh, we treated these mice for four weeks with the, either was a, a 50, 10, or 2 milligram, or in the genotype 2A, we treated these animals for six weeks. But you can see that there were gradual decline of viral level in these, uh, in these mice, both in genotype 1 and genotype 2 infected mice. And there was really no, no, uh, no uh, breakthrough of the viral level suggests that there's no resistance. Typically, when you treat these mice with a DAA, you see a resistance very quickly, the rebound of viral level. So where does chlorocyclazine act? What is the mode of action? So again, using this essay, uh, Melissa was able to show that uh, this act on the entry step. So, this is just a summary of a review article from Charlie's groups. So like all the entry factors, you can see that is really very complicated. A lot of factors are involved in these entry pathway. And using specific virologic assay in terms of kinetic and biochemical, this whole process takes about two hours. All right? So using the sort of various different kinetic assay, we have to show that the chlorocyclazine actually act on the very late stage of the entry, probably near the fusion st stage of the entry. So this is where we are in terms of the mechanism of action. We're still very actively trying to define what exactly is chlorocyclazine acting in this entry process. So in summary, that we think the chlorocyclazine is a very, it's a, it's a potent anti-HCV drugs, is selective, and uh, it's highly synergistic with current drugs and anti-HCV agent. I didn't really show you the data. We've done in vitro synergy analysis with all these approved direct acting antiviral, the CCZ, very synergistic with all of them. And uh, it has a pr preferable liver distribution, which is good. And you can inhibit genotype 1 and 2 infection with no clearly emerging resistant vivo. And so this may be, uh, may be active against all HCV genotypes, although we don't know about all the genotypes yet. And, um, and it has a potentially novel mode of actions, host versus viral, we don't know at this point. And then um, Chris Cole in the, in the branch actually uh, uh, started the phase 1B trial for treatment of uh, chronic HCV patients. And this is really a proof of concept study, a 28 dosing study. And uh, this is sort of interesting. I'm certainly not an expert in this. And you may wonder, how do we proceed with these kind of uh, re repurposing or repositioning of uh, approved drugs for different, for different indications? And uh, I don't think FDA has a clear uh, policy yet. But anyway, I think typically you will probably have to get an IND to do these kind of studies for a particular indication. And, but in our case, because this drug's been around for quite a while, a lot of safety profile, so FDA decided to give us a buy not to have an IND. So we were able to do this study. But the only thing is that we really have to use the dose of medicine that's that's sort of already that use for the antihistamine. We can't use much higher, so therefore we're only using a sort of the the the, the, the over-the-counter dose, so 75 milligram twice a day, and that can be used either in combination of ribavirin or by itself. Um, obviously, this is all we can do. We think this may be on the lower side, but just from the from the PK study we have, this is probably not sufficient to give the concentration that we need in the tissue to reach uh, to reach the anti-CV activity. But nevertheless, this is, this is a pilot study. We'll see. We'll see whether the patient tolerate the medication well and whether we can see whether there's any decline at all with the viral level as well as looking at the, uh, the drug concentration in these, animal, in these uh, patients because there's really no data in human in terms of the PK of these drugs at all. So this is where we are, and uh, I think I'll stop and uh, maybe take some questions. I certainly want to thank uh, all the wonderful people I had the pleasure of uh, associating with in uh, in the uh, liver disease branch over the years, I mentioned about some of the postdocs and fellows and students that have been involved in various different stages of these projects. And um, I think this is really wonderful to really have this opportunity to work with many of them. And you can see that this is really a team effort. And the initial uh, on-eye screen was done with, uh, with uh, uh, collaboration with the HMS group. And certainly, the second part of the study would not be possible with a collaboration with our NCAS collaborators. And these are the 
bunch of them that we've been working together as a team. And I think they're kind of shy, so I don't really have the picture to show. But anyway, I mean, uh, if you do work with NCAS, I'm sure you have a chance to, uh, to meet them as well. And then finally, I certainly would like to uh, thank my collaborator in, uh, in Japan for performing the, the, um, the in vivo study. And then, again, I mean, I think the science cannot be done in isolation. We have to have a lot of interactions and discussions. And this is sort of one of the meetings that I participated in, which KT helped to co-organize. And this was done, this was, I think, four or five years ago. This was collaboration between SCBA and the NIAAA of this particular symposium. And I'm sure you can recognize some of the familiar faces on that picture. And uh, I think this is really what's, what's great, that uh, we're able to interact at that level. And certainly, KT has been uh, particularly instrumental in uh, promoting not only the, the scientific, but also the social awareness of a community. And I know I'll stop. Thank you. So the great talk. So I have a question regarding first part of your talk. You talk about the lipid um, drop and the lipid metabolism associated with the HCV. So I just wonder, given your screen, have you found any drug actually is used in the um, diabetes or the anti-obesity actually from those compounds in your screen? Yeah, there, there, there are really no specific drug that target the lipid droplet as part of the diabetes drug, but there are drugs, for instance, I mentioned to you the, the DAG kinase inhibitor that was actually initially developed trying to treat obesity. That blocks its kinase, prevent lipid droplet formation, and you can see that that worked. And, uh, and other drugs, like statin, there's some evidence that suggests that statin has some anti-CV effect, but you have to use a uh, very, very high, high dose, very super pharmacological dose to see an effect. So, uh, so I, I think it's certainly interesting. I think if you specific target the lipid pathway, maybe some of the drug will cross-react active against HCV. But right now, the, most of the HCV drug, I mean, most of the diabetic drugs really targeting at the sort of insulin sensitizing pathway, so not the lipid droplets. Well, I think they all, they all want to have uh, go to receptions. Have, okay. uh... Well, let me, before we leave, let me make a couple of closing comments. First of all, Jake, thank you for a terrific lecture. Thank you. Um, as, a, as a good friend and colleague of uh, T. Zhang's, uh, I can assure you he would have loved this lecture, uh, not only because he was a quintessential retrovirologist, um, but because of the combination of really rigorous science uh, for the virology and for the cell biology, and the practical applications of this. I think he would have been delighted, and it's really sad that he's not here to hear you talk. But um, I think there are other, other reasons why he would have been particularly pleased that you were the lecturer today, um, one of which is that he himself was a, a mentor of uh, considerable talent. Uh, many of the people in his lab went on to very successful careers. He was a little bit of a tough love mentor, but it was because he really was concerned about career development of the people in his laboratory. Um, and I know, Jake, that you yourself are a terrific mentor as well, and your recognition of all the people who contributed to the science is evidence of that. Um, and finally, we've heard this uh, already many times. Um, uh, T was really a very persistent and very effective proponent for the role of uh, scientists of Asian ancestry in uh, the process of science at the NIH. Um, he, was, he was very effective in working with me and with many of his colleagues in making sure that um, Asian American scientists were recognized for their incredible contributions that you've you heard already from Roland that um, our, our senior faculty is uh, very, very, very much um, supportive of our uh, senior uh, Asian American scientists, but sometimes at the very highest levels there's not recognition of their many contributions, and we will continue to work to do that. I want to recognize uh, T's wife, Diane, and daughter, Diana, who are here as well. Um, and I, uh, I just wanted to say that we really, really miss T, um, and we will remember the lessons that he taught us, um, and we're looking forward to many of these lectures in the future. So there is a reception uh, in the library and we can chat some more and remember some more of the nice things about T's life. Thank you. <laughs>